there's some some people here that and also that are watching and I think the word that they use is that it's like when you lay down to sleep you have what or maybe even while you're awake but you have what's called restless legs where and I'm not here to, to embarrass anybody and the other thing is there's somebody that have been having just really a hard time sleeping at night so here's the thing we'll just do it this way if you have restless legs or you're not sleeping at night so that way you don't want people to know if you got restless legs if you sleep at night you can just raise your hands and be part of the people that don't sleep at night there you go so how many of you you say you know what that's me I'm, I'm, I'm having either one or one of those two categories but we're just lumping into one I feel very strongly that I need to lay hands on you so that this can stop either the sleeping you can start sleeping but also there won't be any restless legs okay I want you to come up here because I want to lay hands on you very quickly just come out to that side come out to this side those of you that are watching we're gonna pray for you amen we're gonna believe God together that this is gonna stop when hands are laid upon you that the anointing breaks yokes and undoes heavy burdens amen Actually, you know what? I feel like you're supposed to pray over them. And I'll pray a prayer. So, and it doesn't matter. Listen, if maybe you're not sleeping at night or maybe your legs are having the restless sleep, is there enough? Is there enough people? Or you can just have them go to the side if there's not. All right, ushers, I want you to get ready because Pastor Brenda is going to pray for you. They're still coming. Just have them go to the side and we'll, we'll pray for these people right now. But I just want to make sure ushers are behind them. Amen. I pray for you, those of you that are watching as Pastor Brenda goes down and ministers to them. I pray and I stretch my hands towards you and every person in this line. We break the spirit of insomnia. We come against any interruption of your sleep, whether it be your legs, your body, pain in your body, or any interference with your mind, your subconscious, your conscious mind. And we release now the anointing of the Lord that breaks this. Lord, we send the word that your servants are healed. They're delivered from restless sleep, restless legs. Lord, we release the anointing of the Spirit of God that restores their sleep, that causes their body to come into a position and a place of strength and of rest. We come against fear. We rebuke anxiety. We come against any mind-binding spirits. We speak to any witchcraft or divination and we break your power. We release the host to break and trash any assignment that would seek to interrupt the people's sleep. We call upon the precious Holy Spirit, touch their body, quicken their mortal body. A prophetic significance of the pirates, the plunderers, the thieves. Doesn't that kind of sound like we've been going through since November? But the plundering pirate buccaneer cheaters, what they're known for, are about to come up against the red commander-in-chiefs. So it might be kind of interesting how it works. Are the thieves going to win or are the commander-in-chiefs in red going to win? And I make no prediction or no prophecy. All I'm going to do is eat some food and watch the Super Bowl and I could care less. Okay. In Luke chapter 17, yeah, sometimes you just got to watch the game and enjoy it. In Luke chapter 17, I want you to look here, but first must he, this is talking about Jesus, suffer many things and be rejected or persecuted of this generation or his generation. Now notice Jesus is talking now and he's making it in context to being rejected and persecuted in his generation. Now, the thought of what he's saying continues because notice the next verse. And as it was in the days of Noah. So it's not just, you know, as in the days of Noah, eating and drinking and giving in marriage. As it continues, he's trying to make a point that even as Noah, who he spoke a prophecy, he spoke a prediction about rain, something that had never happened. They had no reference point of what rain looked like how it was going to come, when it was going to come. They didn't have an understanding of what it meant. They had no proof. Yet Noah was constantly rejected and persecuted of his generation, just like Jesus said, watch this, that it would happen in his generation. As it was in the days of Noah, 
so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. In other words, the Son of Man is going to be rejected. The Son of Man is going to be persecuted just like Noah. And here's the deal. They'll even be eating and drinking and giving in marriage, right? Until the flood comes and destroys them all. So the days of Noah, and this message today is not an end time message uh, about, you know, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, rapture. That's not that message of end times. I believe the king is coming. I believe that that right now that God is opening up something of a new era uh, that is going to eventually usher the king in. That's up to the father when he decides that. But in the meantime, we need to occupy. In the meantime, we need to celebrate because we are coming into something great and something new. And don't believe people that are trying to tell you that everything is over, that everything is just going to get worse, and everything is just going to keep going downhill. No, we are in a new era. Well, how do you know we're in a new era? Because God prophesied it in 2015. He said, when a former president dies on the day they die, the soil America shall shake as a sign that you have entered into a new era. That happened in 2018 when President Bush Sr. died, and on the same day there was a 7.0 earthquake. God's not playing. New era means new faces, new places. And it means that some of the, the faces and things need to go away and be dealt with. Amen. So the days of Noah are talking about not only the literal days of Noah, but making prophetic comparisons to how it relates to today. Okay? How many understand that? So it's not an end time message. What it is, is it's a prophetic message on looking at things that literally happened in the days of Noah and then looking at how it prophetically fits in to what God is trying to tell us in this, this season that we're in. So I'm going to go over these very quickly. I have 17 to go, but I'm going to just do it next week. I only got to like a few of them today. And so uh, let's start with the one that I talked about last week. The days of Noah. In the day of Noah, the literal day of Noah, Noah was a prophet who had a ridiculous sounding prophecy of rain. You could read that in Genesis 6. God had never sent rain before. In fact, when they began to prophesy that there would be rain that came, they didn't even know what rain was. They had no reference point. But yet they scoffed at Noah. They persecuted Noah. They called Noah false. They mocked him year after year after year. And you talk about some people caved when January 20th came. Some people caved, right, when, when, when January is, is up. Well, where's the justice? Listen, you don't know stuff that's going on behind the scenes. And don't think that there was justice that is going to be served when you put your hand on a Bible and take an oath. And if there has been thievery and trickery and, tre- and corruption, you could have committed something very wrong that demands justice. Yeah. Well, where's February of Fury? I believe God's not happy. So sometimes we look for everything in the natural to to prove it out. But I think there's some things that God's doing on his end that we are going to see. That he's had enough is enough is enough. And you're going to see the fury and the vengeance of God. So in the days of Noah, there was this ridiculous prophecy. It's going to rain. Well, what's rain, you fool? And he kept building 120 years. And they would come by. Repent! You're a false uh, prophet, Noah. And Noah would just keep hammering away. So in the days of Noah, we have to remember that not everybody is going to fully discern what God has said, what he's going to do, and not even, listen to me, not even the messengers know. Do you think Noah knew what rain was? Nowhere does it say that God sat down and said, now Noah, you need to explain your prophecy. Most prophets in the Bible, when God would prophesy them, they would say, what meaneth this? What is this? What are you showing me? And many times God didn't tell them the answer. When Nineveh was being judged, Jonah was sent by God. Nineveh, repent in 40 days. Notice he put timing on it. It didn't happen. And when it didn't happen, he wasn't, he didn't have to repent. Not like what we're seeing here today. Noah didn't even know how rain was going to come. He didn't even know how his prophecy was going to come to pass. Sometimes you got to get the how out of here. Because it's not a natural thing that you can cause God to be held to a date, January 20th and whatever else your date is. Some things are God's events that he has pre-planned that has the divine will and purpose of God that is going to happen no matter what. Doesn't matter how much you squall, ball, doesn't matter how much you agree, how much you cave in, how much you fear. 
And there are times in certain prophecies like with Noah that God tells you, you just prophesy it and you're not accountable to make it come to pass or explain how it's going to come to pass. If you, are, if you are spiritually mature, you will get off the back of the prophets that are prophesying and declaring the word of the Lord. They don't always know how, they don't know always when, and they don't always know what their prophecy means. Can you imagine being the ones that prophesied about the Messiah? No wonder they got stoned. What do you mean he's going to come riding in on a donkey? What do you mean that a virgin is going to conceive? What do you mean you're going to rebuild the temple in three days? How are you going to do that? And they wanted to kill him when he said that. Because they constantly misunderstood what he was trying to say. And many times Jesus did not sit down and say, Now, boys, and those of you that are calling me false, and, 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 and you think I'm a heretic, because they thought he was a false prophet. Because when they beat him over the head, come on, you can read it. They whipped him and called him a false prophet and said, prophesy, you blasphemer. They, even to the time of his crucifixion, they thought he was a false prophet. But Jesus did not spend his whole ministry trying to make sure that they got it. He just kept prophesying. He kept teaching. And he said, let those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of God is saying. So trolls, it's obvious you don't have spiritual ears to hear. So keep making your troll house cookies and drop your droppings somewhere else. So, welcome to your message. Now, number one, the days of Noah had ridiculous sounding prophecy, but yet it came to pass. And it wasn't in the timing of man or the timing that they thought, let alone Noah. He never had any indication that it was going to come to pass. He was required by God to keep standing and hold on to what God said and not worry about the how, the if, and the when. That's the days of Noah, and that's our day too. Now, the second thing that the days of Noah was, are you ready? The days of Noah, the family did not attack the word from prophet Noah. You did not see Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, sitting around going, hey, come over here, my dad is an absolute nut. Okay, rain, what's rain? You didn't see him taking out newspapers and writing on their social media pages or on the side of the ark. Don't believe him. It's all fake. You didn't see them attacking one another in the days of Noah. You saw families stick together. Jesus said, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Where is the love? Where, where, is, where is, rather than fighting against each other, we're fighting against the real enemy that, is, that came and stole and tried to kill and destroy our nation. Where is that kind of fight that rather than we're fighting against each other that's what we're doing a kingdom divided cannot stand we're attacking one another we're 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 we're. how much money do you need to give to foreign entities and not even be able to give a stimulus check that has any kind of money or substance to it to the people why is everything about everybody else but the american people because that's what pirates do that's what thieves do And they have no value for your human life. That's why the first thing that they sign in their executive order is to now use your taxpayer money to destroy, yes, destroy little babies in the womb. And people put their approval next to that. Is this really what you want? So in the days of Noah, they didn't attack each other. They held true. We may not understand it. We may not know when. We may not how we just know that god you have said it and we stand and in the meantime we're going to continue to build the ark which is the church we're going to build the kingdom we're going to preach the gospel heal the sick cast out devils and we are not going to attack one another we are going to fight not in a violent way but we are going to stand for the united states of america for morality are you listening rather than do what they're doing disgrace our soldiers no we are going to absolutely welcome love honor our veterans our soldiers and so much more so in the days of Noah they didn't attack one another like everybody's attacking each other today they knew better they didn't want to miss the ark believe me you can miss your day of visitation you can miss what God will do and is in the process of doing because you got into the how and the what and the if or you listen to other people out, out, outside. Number three, in the days of Noah, there was one window in the ark. And that's in Genesis chapter 6 where God told Noah, you put one window up above so that you don't notice there was no other windows, just one. And it was 
so he could keep looking up. His attention, his focus, and perspective was on God, not on the things that are happening outside. The reason why some people are so quick to attack, so quick to, to, to demand others do certain things is because they're looking at and they're not looking up. Well, the prophets need to repent. I remember years ago, there was somebody that came into my office. And if this hits too close to home, for some of you, you might. So he, he came in, he demanded that I repent. And, 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 and uh, my wife was in there with me. And I don't meet with people like that anymore. Okay? No, because uh, somebody's going to get hurt and it'd be them. And so probably their feelings. But you're not going to come and take shots at the pastor. Excuse me. So they were accusing us of all kinds of stuff, you know. You know, I like it when people, they, they always attack, you know. Um, you know, I, I, they, I, I'm just telling you, they're, they're just taking all the money from the church. What? And they've got this over-exuberant salary. I don't, even, I don't even set my salary. I have an outside board that determines my salary based on national averages. For years, I didn't even take a raise because I'd rather put it into... Uh, and the board kept saying, you need to take a raise. I didn't take a raise for like, what, 10, 12 years, whatever it was. Just kept giving it to the other people. Because here's my point. People will make up screwball-y stuff. And so anyway, they, they decided that, they, that this pastor was whatever. I'm not even going to speak whatever the ridiculous accusation was. But what I did say, you know, the controlling pastor thing. Have you ever heard that one before? And I thought, well, I'm so controlling. I couldn't control you to behave yourself. But... <laughs> But the point was, I said, look, I will, I will, I will check my character. Because I think it's always important that you check your character. It's always important that you let God deal with you. That you don't live in pride. You, you know, you make sure you're treating the people right. Make sure you're treating one another right. But they kept calling out this demand for repentance. And finally, God spoke to me and he said, Hank, he said, I am absolutely fed up with what they're doing and the spirit of what they carry. I said, really, what do you want me to do? He said, what you need to do is I've been trying to get them to repent, so here's what I want you to tell. I want you to tell him that he needs to repent and that you are now exposing the fact that he's been committing adultery with his wife. And so I said it to him. His wife got up and said, you're a liar, and she pointed her finger at me. And he said, you're a liar. I said, really? So why am I seeing uh, last Thursday and God showing me where you went, and I see you went in here with this other lady, and this is what you did. His wife stood back and she pushed him and called him unchristian names. Um, <laughs> Brenda, you were there. And, and she said, how in the beep, beep, beep would he know that? You lied to me. You said you were going to that place last Thursday. So be careful when you are demanding somebody else to repent that there isn't the finger of God on you and some of your slime bully, sleazy things that you won't let God deal with. We need to keep preaching. My God, they just got to... So there was, there was one window in the ark, and it was at the top of the ark. It was really up there. It was so high up there. It was so beautiful. You could see God. We love you, God. Okay. And then the fourth one was there was three stories in the ark. They had a lower story, a middle section, and a third story. And here's what's amazing. Have you ever thought about this? Imagine... Can you imagine, where do you think he put the animals? Do you think he put the animals on the middle and then he slept on the bottom? Or do you think that maybe, you know, I, I don't know, because I wouldn't want the animals above me. I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to be sleeping, you know, and all of a sudden, drip. Oh my gosh. Honey, did you brush before bed? I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm talking about Noah, honey. I'm talking about Noah. I so am talking about Noah. So can you imagine? I mean, some drips. I mean, you had the animals all up there. No way. So you can probably imagine the animals were probably on the bottom, or maybe the Noah and his whole eight people were up on the top. But anyway, there were stories in the ark. And what am I saying? God is still telling his story. It's not over. Just let God tell a story. You just keep building. All right, now let's go to number five. So, this is the one, the new one, so we can get on with it. In the days of Noah, there were strict dimensions given to the ark that must be followed. Strict dimensions that must be followed. So, God gave strict dimensions, okay? Now, you say, well, that was in the days of Noah. What does that have to do with us today? So, if, if, so if we are in the days of Noah, prophetically speaking again... Just like there was a ridiculous prophecy with no reference point, no proof, and no uh, understanding of how, when, and why, and all of that, 
Why would God put strict dimensions that must even be followed today? Because there's a prophetic meaning to these dimensions. Look at Genesis 6, verse 15. And this is the fashion, or this is the pattern, which you shall make this ark. Notice the length of it shall be 300 cubits. Underline 300. And the breadth of it, or the depth of it, shall be 50 cubits, and the height shall be 30 cubits. Notice it was a height. It was a height. It was the height was 30 cubits, okay? The length of it was 300. Now you say, well, that was what it was literally in the days of Noah, that Noah's ark was 350 and 30. So how does that relate to the days of Noah today? Again, these were strict dimensions that God said you must build it this way. Because Noah's ark represents two things. It represents the church or a type or a picture of what the New Testament church would be. That if you get into the ark, okay, you get into the church where salvation is offered, how I many understand there's protection, right? But it also represents the ark of what we are as believers. We are part of the ark. We're part of the church. Now, here's what 300 is. How many remember the story of Gideon's army? In Genesis chapter 7, there was 32,000 that were with Gideon. 32,000. And watch this, 22,000, God was going to bring them down to a water of testing. There's a testing of their faith. Don't think that we're in a season right now where God is testing our faith. Testing, what are we going to believe? Are we going to cave in? What are we going to believe? Are we going to stand? And so think about this, 22,000 went ahead and left out of the 32,000, 22,000 left because they were in fear. That's where some people are. They've completely abandoned what God has said. They, have, they think that America is going down. They think there is no future for this nation. They're basing everything off the circus that's happening. Right? But there's a point where the circus uh, packs up and has to leave town. And so, um, so in the meantime, 300, okay, so there's 22,000 now that's, uh, that's uh, no, actually 22,000 left and 10,000 uh, was left, okay, that came down to the water. 22,000 went in fear, 10,000 remained, and God brought them down to the waters of testing. And the problem with 9,700 9, of them is that they lapped up the blessings and completely did something that was so important if they were going to be numbered among the 300. And it's the very thing that we as Christians must not forget. 9,700 lapped up the blessings, and they put their face in all the blessings and just kept lapping it up and ignored what was happening in front of them. That's where some people are at. Well, I'm not watching the news, but yet at the same time, you're playing the passive Christian. Okay? You know what passive Christian is? is You just want the blessings for you, but you don't realize that what God was looking for and why he chose the 300 in, in Judges 7 was because they would take and they would bring the water up and they would lap like a dog and they would keep their eyes upon the enemy that was on the horizon. In other words, don't take your eyes off of what they're trying to do to this nation. Don't you dare take your eyes off of what they're trying to do to your children. Don't you dare take your eyes off of what they're trying to indoctrinate us with and try to cause us to just accept it. Okay? Don't take your eyes off of it. God is looking for 300, and that's what that Noah's Ark represents. He's looking for a church or people in his church that will have a remnant spirit that is not in it to be afraid. You're not in it to lap up the blessings and do nothing with your Christianity or your voice or your stance. You're going to stand for something. You're going to be a 300 remnant people. Listen, pastors that you didn't open up your churches and you're still afraid of whatever, you're not part of the 300. Okay? You're just not. So what does 50 represent? Well, 50 is the number for Pentecost. 50 is the number for the Spirit. How many know the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost? Number 50, 50 days. So what does that represent? Well, God wants Spirit-filled arcs. He wants Spirit-filled churches. He wants the Holy Spirit to move and to show off and have His glory and have His say. He wants the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. He wants devils to come out in service. Yeah, even at baby dedication where you bring granny and all of a sudden granny has a demonic manifestation. Amen? But she gets free. Before she goes home at 101. Amen? I love granny. But you understand, 50 is the number for Pentecost. 50 is the number of the Holy Spirit. Now, how does that relate to the believer? God wants spirit-filled, spiritual-acting believers. Not ones that are arguing and fighting on social media, showing all of your carnality out there. 
right? Showing your disagreement, showing, come on. He's looking for spiritual people. He's looking for spiritual people that could trust God. And he's not, and they're not set to a date. Some people caved in on January 20th. Oh, it's all over. Why? Well, don't you understand history and how everything's always gone? I'm sure that's exactly how the scoffers felt in the days of Noah. Well, it's never did what you're describing there, Prophet Noah. Well, are you going to be spiritual? See, the spiritual ones are the ones that are going to make the ark. The spiritual ones are the ones that God is looking for. I want my church to act spiritual. Jesus said the world will know that you are Christians if you love one another. Now, love is not acceptance and just, you know, you just embrace everything that that happens. No, you love the people, but you educate them because the Scripture says you are to speak the truth in love. Some people, they don't even speak the truth. They just think they're speaking love while they accept everything that God says. Wait a minute. That's not what I said. You understand? you got to be careful. So there's 300, the remnant. There's 50, Pentecost. But now there's 30. What is 30? Notice that was the height. That was the stature, okay? Jesus entered into his ministry at 30 years of age. Joseph entered in at 30 years of age. Ezekiel, uh, there was a shift in Ezekiel's life at 30 years of age. John the Baptist at 30 years of age. 30 is a number that speaks of maturity. So God wants you to be part of a church that keeps your eye on the enemy. We're not talking violence. We're talking about spiritual enemies, but we're also talking about keep your eyes on on the things that are trying to touch and destroy your nation. The kingdom of God. Your life, your finances, whatever. And then God's expecting you to stay spiritual. That's the 50. But he wants you to be 30. He wants you to be mature and act like it. Quit acting like an like a immature, undisciplined Christian. Right? Are you here? Okay, so that's that one. Number six. In the days of Noah... God remembered his covenant. Now, how many of you know what a covenant is? Covenant is an agreement. God said uh, he could find no one greater, so he swore by himself, and he entered a covenant in with Abraham. But a covenant, just like when Brenda and I got married, how many of you know that, that the covenant was, um, you know, uh, yes, dear, and no, I'm teasing. No, the covenant was 100%, 100%. And we've been married 32 years. And here's the thing. When we came into covenant, we came into agreement. Until death do, our, do we part. We, we work hard to keep that agreement and that unity in marriage. So God, look at what he said in Genesis 6 with Noah. Noah, but with you I'll establish my covenant. In other words, I'm going to do something with you. What is he saying? I'm going to keep my word. So not only did God establish his covenant... How does that relate in the days of Noah? God said, after 120 years, hey, it's going to rain. I've had enough of the evil. I've had enough of the corruption. I'm sure Noah at times thought, God, how much longer? I'm sure Noah was setting his own dates. I'm sure that Noah was saying, Lord, I'm just not quite done building the ark. And I'm sure God was looking, saying, you're not done building the ark. Hurry up. So there was a moment where God ultimately, what he said in that day of Noah came to pass because he had a covenant agreement. There are certain things that God has promised for the earth, in the earth, to the earth, that will happen. It doesn't matter what people are saying. Doesn't matter what the scoffers are saying. Doesn't matter your timetable. God will, just like in the days of Noah, remember his covenant. He remembered what he said. He remembered what he promised. He, he held to what he said he would do. Eventually, it happened. And it wasn't on your timetable or Noah's. This is where people are at. January 20th came and went. We're still now moving into February and people are putting their own interpretation on stuff. They're putting interpretation on prophecies. And if January of justice doesn't happen like they like or February of fury or March of what was the other March of celebration, you know, oh, they're false or it didn't happen. No, that's not extending the goalposts. It's the truth. And here's the bottom line. Ultimately, what you have to stand for is that God said it It will happen. It will come to pass. If he remembered his covenant with Noah, he's going to remember the forefathers, and he's going to remember all of those that prayed and touched his heart. Are you listening? That's why there was that moment of silence. How many remember that two-minute moment of silence that that happened uh, at the the time of the inauguration? They were all fidgety because they know what they did. Are you listening? That's why they're all fidgety. 
It's amazing how the spotlight was on each of them too. Because they know what they did. They know what they've been doing. And so there was a moment of silence. And I really believe that it's, it's, it's Revelation chapter 8. Do you know that the, the Bible says you're going to see a prophecy that, remember we prophesied last Sunday that it would snow in Washington, D.C. By the way, they're saying the snow drought has ended. Isn't that interesting using the word drought? It was when the drought ended in the days of Elijah that God, man, he came down and kicked backside. And... Don't you hear? So now they're calling a snow drought that God prophesied last Sunday here. Now here's the point. The point is, so it talks about in that prophecy we're going to see at the end here where God says, I've taken the prayers and I've put them in, in bowls and I'm, and I'm going to pour those bowls or those prayers out. People keep saying, well, people didn't pray enough or this and that. Listen, no, God has heard our prayers. But if you read Revelation 8, do you remember what happened before God poured the bowls that had the prayers of the saints with it? There was silence in heaven for a half hour. Isn't it interesting? I believe that when there was that silence and all that circus was going on, God caused there to be a pause literally in the earth and on that day to say, saints, don't grow weary. I'm remembering my covenant. I'm remembering what I said. I'm remembering your prayers. I'm about to pour it down. And this thing is going to get gooder and gooder and gooder. And it's about to get fun. Are you here? All right. Number seven. In the days of Noah, this is really good. In the days of Noah, Noah understood that there were, uh, that gender, I uh, better, better reread this. In the days of Noah, he understood gender the way God designed it. And in the days of Noah, there was only two genders. And in the days of Noah today, doesn't matter what they say, what they put in the books and what they put on the cabinet and in the cabinet and, and what's wearing a wig. The bottom line was in the days of Noah, there was two genders. And in the days of Noah today, there's only two genders. This isn't hard. So in the days of Noah, God designed gender, male and female. There wasn't, there wasn't male, female, and in between. There was not G.I. Joe, G.I. Jane, and G.I. Don't Know doll. There was nothing in between, either G.I. Joe or G.I. Jane. That was it. There was nothing in between. So in the days of Noah, Noah understood gender the way God designed it. Look at Genesis 6, verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark, keep them alive, and they shall be watch, male and female. So, Noah now has the job of gender identification supervision. And to make sure that it was exactly the way God wanted. God did not want anything except two genders on the boat. Well, how do you know? Genesis 7, look at verse 2. Genesis 7, let's go ahead, put it up for people at home. Okay, Genesis 7, verse 2. And of every clean beast thou shalt take to the sevens, male and female. Notice, male and female. And they are not clean by two, male and female. Notice, two genders, male and female. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. And God repeats himself again. <laughs> of fowls also the air by seven, the male and the female. So even the birds, you can cry fowl all you want, but there was male and female. If you cry fowl, it was only male and female. Right? Amen. Even though they're crying foul, it still was male and female. Now notice in verse 9, we still see it again. They went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, male and female, as God suggested to Noah. No, as God what? God commanded. So if God commanded, and Jesus said in Matthew, the book of Matthew, that God created them in the beginning, male and female. And Jesus said in that same chapter, marriage is between one man and one woman. Then if God, if Jesus backed it up, then why are we letting textbooks and school boards and everything try to redefine what God said? That's not hate. That's called creation, the way that God created. Now, in the days of Noah, in the days of Noah, Noah was commanded. It was not a suggestion. It was commanded. Look at verse, six, uh, look at verse uh, 16. Let's go to another verse. And they went in, male and female, 
male and female. So Noah, God commanded him. All right, Noah, clean and unclean, male and female. If any animal shows up with a wig trying to bring something else, it ain't going to pass. That's not what I commanded. You can love them, but that's not what I said to you and what I created. Yes or no? Let's have a science project. So the animals come. Here comes the giraffe. Noah looks and says, male, go over here into the male skull. Female, go over into the female skull. And don't, you're not allowed to go in each other's bathrooms. You understand? You understand? You stay over there. Male giraffe over here. Lady giraffe over here. Well, Pastor Hank, how did he know that they were male and female? I'm glad you asked. Depending upon their male parts that they were born with, they were male. And depending upon the female parts that they were born with, then they were considered female. And the male and the female got together in the ark and had some, and they had little babies. Okay. So there's your science. And I kept it G-rated. Are you listening? Male and female. Male and female. Okay? He didn't allow any other suggestions. Because that's not what God created and it's not what God commanded. Now, if somebody thinks of that, we love them. We'll help you. But that's not the design of God. So if it wasn't that way in the days of Noah, then why are we trying to make it today in our days of Noah? Okay? No, here's what we do in our days of Noah. Oh, okay, dude. Um, I mean, you know, you, you send your little daughter into the restroom. You know, and, and, and you're the father and you're standing out there and your 10-year-old daughter goes into the bathroom and some dude with hairy legs and high heels, uh, uh, shoe size 17, uh, you know, and, and, and a wig. Excuse me, I got to go to the restroom. And he goes in there because he's a woman and he thinks he's a woman. You better not go into my bathroom with my daughter. So in the days of Noah, it was clearly defined. Why are you allowing the teachers at the school to try to make you have to accept what God didn't design or command? Christians just came. Oh, okay, teacher. Um, I, I guess if... Um... Or the little boy, you know, says, well, you know, mommy, I feel like I'm a girl. Oh, you're just supposed to accept it. And if you say and try to teach them the way God created, then you're a bigot. They, they take your kid away from you. That he should be able to express himself. Are you kidding me? You heard, about, uh, you heard about the Tour de France, right? You know that famous bike race? Yeah, the winner of it was a guy with a motorcycle, but he said his motorcycle was a bike. I mean, when's this stuff going to stop? Right? I mean, when's it going to stop? Two genders, male and female. Male and female. Well, how do you know? Um, again, male parts and female parts. Okay. It's not hard. And let me tell you this. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. Here's another thing. Now, let's, 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 let's hit this one while we're underneath male and female. But with you, Noah, I will establish my covenant... And thou shalt come into the ark. Watch this. You and, okay, thou and thy sons and thy wife. And thy sons' wives will be under. Well, see, Pastor Hank, right there. Right there. So Noah, he could have had another man for his wife. Doesn't say. Um, excuse me. God told them to replenish the earth. Okay. Noah had a wife, male and female, it was traditional marriage, a male and female, male parts and woman parts made Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So we can establish that that wife, by definition, in the days of Noah, a wife was a woman. Thank you for one clap. We love everyone. And the sons, well, how do you know that their sons didn't have some guy of, of same sex? Wait a minute. Because their wives, which were women, male and female, 
had children. And the only way that they could replenish was it to be male and female, husband meaning a man, and female being wife. And they got together, and the birds and the bees caused them to have families. Because <laughs> Noah's Ark was not about saving the animals. It was about saving families. And you can't procreate if they were all the same gender or had a bunch of mixed up genders. Are you here? So that was the days of Noah. And somehow I believe that's still the days of Noah today. We just need some Christians to understand what God has created and be willing to speak the truth in love. You don't demean anyone. You don't make anyone feel like they're stupid or they're sinful. What you do is you love them. But you've got to speak truth. Well, i got relatives. and It doesn't matter. Speak the truth. Okay? Jesus repeated. Okay, that's number eight. How many of you got that now? Okay. Did you like our science project? Today, they tell you what you want to embrace. It's caused gender confusion. And they say a traditional marriage is not, not the way. Well, we, you know the truth now. In the days of Noah, Noah had to discern between the unclean and the clean. Okay? Look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 2. If they could come up to the piano. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, male and female. his female. Male and his female. His female. Brenda is married to Hank, which is her female. I don't know. Does that make sense? In other words, it was, very, it was, it was no, no, there's no need to try to read. A male and his female. In other words, two of a kind. Male, female of giraffes, of elephants. So they could have more giraffes. You understand? Do I need to keep explaining it? Okay, well then start speaking up in love. Of every clean beast thou shalt take by seven, male and female, and beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So here's what God is saying. There's a great harvest that's coming upon the earth, and we need to understand that the church isn't always about perfect people. Okay? If there is, you know, people that, you know, they're gender confused, or they're struggling with their gender, we need to love them, and they're welcome in the church. We're, we, we will love them. We will help them. We will tell them the truth, teach them the truth. We'll love them. Maybe something happened to them. You know, we, we're not here to judge anyone. Maybe if there's, you know, two people that think that, you know, that, that God ordained traditional or true marriage to be two guys or two girls. Listen, sometimes you're going to have clean and unclean. You're going to have people that come in where you need to love them and help them. But it's your job as a preacher and as a congregation to show them the way of the Lord more earnestly. Not in judgment, not in condemning, but there's the church arc is never to always be just perfect. We think that everybody, you know, if they don't look like us, then, then they're not welcome in our church. Right? Are you here? So somebody comes in with tats, so what? Somebody comes in and doesn't look quite right, so what? Let's get them cleaned up. Let's help them. Amen? But here's the other thing. Notice that Noah had the incredible role to play that he had to call out what was clean and what was unclean. Here's the problem. In the days of Noah, he could do it. He could say, that's unclean, that's clean. Here, here, here's where people are in our day. They call good evil. They call evil good. They don't know the difference, like Ezekiel says, the difference between holy and profane. I know people that, and I'm not here to pick on movies, but I'm going to pick on them for a minute. I know people that are like, oh, it's a great movie. I mean, you know, just a few, you know, cussing and profanity. And, you know, they take the Lord's name in vain like, you know, only 70 times. Really? You want to sit through while they just absolutely do that to your Lord and Savior? I've walked out of movie theaters when they kept taking the name of Jesus in vain. I'm like, I ain't paying for this. Get out of here. Or I've known people, oh, that's, a, that's a great movie. I mean, if you can get past the five uh, sex scenes, what are you watching that stuff for? I mean, shouldn't there be a difference between the holy and the profane? Shouldn't you, in your day of Noah, be able to say, um, that's dirty, that's clean. I'm not putting that in my soul. It's amazing to me how many people are so quick to point fingers at everybody else and yet their own little closet is dirty. Listen, you can't be bold if you're dirty. No, because your soul will torment you. 
There has to be a difference today between clean and unclean. You need to be able to say, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, teacher, but uh, our, our, our little boy um, or our little girl, no, 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 that, that's dirty, dirty to, to have, uh, you know, men, I don't care if they're dressed up or not, go into our, our, our children's bathroom. That, that's dirty. That's not clean. That's dirty. It's not right. Are you, are you listening? We need to start speaking up. No, 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 that, 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 that's dirty. That's dirty. Okay. Where, where, where is the church standing up when they're sitting here wanting to absolutely define what's moral in our society? And they cancel anything that's good and wholesome, and, they, and they, they, they use everything they can to try to convince you that this needs to be canceled. Listen, some of the stuff they're canceling was some of the greatest uh, laughter that, that, that we grew up laughing about things. Today, we can't laugh about anything. Everything's so serious. Everything is always attacking somebody, and, right? But we don't understand the difference between clean and unclean. Now, go ahead and stand your feet because I want to show you this last one. The ninth one in the days of Noah... I want you to listen to this very carefully as you stand, because I want you to stretch a little bit because I'm going to get done here. In the days of Noah, God shut the door. Now, notice this in Genesis 7, verse 14. I want you to pay very close attention. And they went in, male and female, of all flesh, as God had commanded him. Now, notice, did Noah shut the door to the ark? Who shut the door? And the Lord shut him in. So who shut the door? God. Why is that important? Think about this. In the actual days of Noah, here you had a prophet stand up, Noah, for 120 years, say it's going to rain. There was no reference point. No one knew what rain was. There was no proof that it would ever happen, but he just kept building in, in the midst of mockery and being accused of all kinds of stuff. He just kept hammering away at what God said. And the violence and the corruption on the outside kept getting worse and worse and worse. Otherwise, it doesn't ever say anywhere that God interrupted Noah and said, now, wait a minute, it's year 80 now. You've been doing this for 80 years, Noah. You need to hurry up. And there's a few more people that are going to uh, come on the boat now because, you know, I want you to add an extension. So it, that tells you that things just kept getting more and more and more and more corrupt and violent on the outside. Now, there is one thing in this modern day that God has absolutely had enough. And Jesus even said it'd be better that a millstone was tied around their neck than to cause one of the little ones to stumble. The pedophilia, sex trafficking rings that have been going on around the nation, around the world, demands justice. And we're all looking, you know, January 20th comes... End of January comes. Oh, when's it going to happen, God? Now, I'm sure Noah felt that way. God, the world's getting more and more corrupt. The world's getting more and more evil because of nowhere did God ever tell him to shorten his time or to add an extension, which means that God just kept letting the evil, so it would seem, go unchecked and unaccounted for. It looked like God was not going to answer. It looked like the day would never come. And it looked like the prophet was an absolute idiot building this boat and saying something misleading the people. But there was a moment then where I'm glad that it was not Noah that shut the door. Because what ultimately happened to deal with the corruption and to deal with the violence that was happening in that day of Noah is the same reason why I'm glad God didn't look at January 20th he didn't look at January. He's not looking at your date and the way that you want. Because if Noah shut the door in his day, then it would demand that in our day of Noah, that man would be in control. And what God did in Noah's day was supernatural. And what God's going to do in our day, when God feels like it and it's time, he's going to shut the door and he's going to deal with the corruption. He's going to deal with the evil. He's going to deal with the pedophilia and all the other junk that some of these people have sold out for. And the door will be shut. And at that moment, God's judgment and vengeance will hit. And he will stand by what he said through his servants. And it's going to get interesting out there. And somehow I believe, I don't know why, but I believe that that door might just be shut. 
So let me read you the prophecy from last week as we end here. Is that all right? Because I, I want you to see something. So right now, the report is they're having snow in D.C. Uh, some are saying up to well, how many? Does anybody heard the latest report? They're what? What kind of snow? I didn't hear you. What? A lot of snow. But no, how many heard about the snow drought has ended? So notice again that prophet Elijah was the one that ended the drought through his prophetic words. And it took seven times. Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Hear the sound of rain. There was no proof. There was no evidence. But he just kept telling them, go. I'm sure that most people today were up to the second time. All right, you're false. I've gone twice now. January 20th's come. January justice didn't happen like we think. February fury, I don't even know about that one. I'm done. No, seven times. But finally, the drought was ended. And once the drought ended, it signaled a shift in everything. It's amazing that they've had a snow drought and that it's interesting they use that word. Especially when you hear what God said last Sunday. All right, let's read it real fast. Are you ready? If you could see what I see, if you could hear what I hear, and if you knew what I know and you understood the plan that I've devised at this time, your heart would not fear. You would not be filled with wonder and you would not be filled with doubt. Your mouth would not be filled with unbelief and discussion in the land. Words that seem as though things are over. But yet I say to you, I will give many signs that the movement of my feet and the movements of my hand, in fact, have already begun. And the hosts who are at my command will operate and work with my plan to bring things that even though your eyes would see it, your ears would hear it, you would struggle to conceive it in your heart. Could it be possible? But yet what I shall do is not to be interpreted with mere intellect or predictability. This is why those who worship me must worship me in the spirit, for I am a God who sees and knows all things in the spirit and even in the natural. But yet you look in the natural... And you think that this is the way that things shall always be. Therefore, listen to my feet as the soil of your land shall shake and the intensity of my movements will increase. How many know that's happening? And it shall be unusual where I place my feet. Pay attention for words that they will say it is not shaken in this place like this. And there will be other places where they will say it is not shaken like this at all. What is this? Is this the soil? It is my feet. Now, this is the part I want you to hear and those of you that are watching. Almost done. And then watch as my feet, or watch as my fist, watch as my fist has been raised up over this nation, that the injustice and the evil that say shall stand, I will smack down and I will strip what they think shall stand. I have the wind in my fist. How many notice the winds? Pay attention to the winds. Keep your eyes upon the shores of the east. Now watch this. Keep your eyes upon the cities of the east, even your capital. Okay, how many see that? Look at it. Are they showing it? Good. Pay attention. Oh, wait a minute. Where am I at? Okay, okay. Around your capital. For great force winds shall come. And what shall fall? No. For as I dealt, as my scripture declares in the book of Psalms. This is also Psalm 68, 14. I dealt with what kind of kings? Wicked kings while it was what? Snow. Snowing in Zalman. So God's making a comparison of snow that's going to hit D.C. Of Psalm 68 that has to deal with wickedness and what else? Leaders. And snow. He said, pay attention. I will show you once again where the snow falls. Pay attention to what? To your what? To your what? To your capital. Pay attention to those places upon the east. Some of them are getting hammered. That I am, in fact, dealing with what? Injustice. See, you don't think so because it seems like it's taken too long. <laughs> Pay attention. For where it snows, it shall mark a what? Cleansing. A cleansing. Isn't that what David said? Wash me as white as snow. How I many is that Psalm 68, 14? Is that right? Somebody look at it. Is that Psalm 68, 14? Because I didn't want to give you the wrong reference. That it was snowing. Uh, let's see. Let me read it. Psalm 68, 14. I'm going to read you the rest and we're going to call it a day because I'm going to go eat something and go to sleep. <laughs> All right. Yeah, when the Almighty scattered kings while it was snowing in Zalman. That's Psalm 68, 14. Okay, now watch this. It'll mark cleansing. I've heard the sounds of the cries of my children. I've heard them, and I've heard those prayers that were brought before my throne, and they filled the bowls, the prayers of the saints for you, United States. And they are being poured out, and you'll see it. I've not forsaken you. I think that's why that silence was at that inauguration, or that, that what they said was inauguration. And because it's Revelation 8, there had to be a pause. I've not forsaken you. I've not forsaken this nation. Stand and you'll see the salvation of your God. Amen. All right, Lord. 
We worship you and honor you, Father. And I pray for everybody in the sound of my voice, Lord. We love people. I'm sure there's going to be those that are going to say, oh, we just attacked people. No, we didn't. the entrance office. Drive safely. It is a speed limit enforcement of 100 kilometers ahead of about 200 meters. It has been processed normally. You have passed the entrance office. Drive safely. limit enforcement of 100 kilometers ahead of about 400 meters. It is a speed limit enforcement of 100 kilometers ahead of about 200 meters.